Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Globe Church live stream this afternoon. My name's Johnny, I'm one of the elders of the Globe Church and I'll be leading us through this service today. Today we are reflecting on what John T taught us last week as we looked at the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. We talked about this liberation curve, if you remember it, if you were able to see the service last week. That is to say that although there are struggles and trials in the earth today, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our future has been sealed and we have a certain hope of a day when we have been liberated from all of the things we experience today. But that doesn't mean that as Christians we simply live in this future place and what we're doing today is irrelevant. No, we can work for and serve the God who came to save us, the God who sent Jesus to die and rise again for us. And so to start our service today, we're going to hear from Jane, who has been doing some thinking and reflecting on what it means to work for and to serve God, particularly in this current times when so many of our work has been disrupted. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to start the service by hearing from Jane and her reflections on what it means to work for God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that this week, as we look back at Easter Sunday last week, we can celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we can think about what that means for our lives today, what it means to live for, to work for and to serve our Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be excited by Jesus and we pray that we would be more like him and that we would live more like him as a result of this. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Hi, Globe Church. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Jane. I've been asked to share some of my thoughts around a right approach to work at this difficult and tragic time. And as I was thinking about how to encourage us and build us up as a church family, I was aware that people would be listening from really differing positions this afternoon. Some of us are as busy or busier than ever. In fact, life feels different, but the same. And some of us aren't working and we wish that we were. And perhaps we're really worried about what the long term work prospects are for us. So we know that wherever we stand right now, work has always been a part of God's plan for humanity since the beginning of Genesis. It's part of his big picture and it has intrinsic value for us. We've seen how incredibly important work is to us as a society, a community of people in this nation. We've seen the very appropriate and public recognition of key workers. We've seen the long hours and the stressful nature of what they're currently doing. We've seen the impact on our daily lives when people aren't able to be safely in their workplace. But at the same time that some workforces are being applauded, other employers are treating their people with contempt and a degree of brutality and self-interest that should make them ashamed. As I reflected, I felt strongly directed towards Romans 12 verse 1. Let me read it to you, first of all, in the NIV. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I'm going to read it to you in the New King James Version as well. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. What's it saying to us, this verse? Well, it's saying that because of Romans 1 to 11, because of everything that Jesus has done for us, Paul urges us to use our bodies as a sacrifice to God, not in order to earn anything, because we can't, but as worship to him. Or as the New King James Version says, this is our reasonable service. Do you remember the Globe Daily where Jonty talked about the unseen servants who served in the tabernacle during the night hours? Well, it strikes me as the same idea. What we do, we do in his service. And once we think like that, I think it changes our approach to all that's happening at the moment and where we and our work fit into it. Let's think about that. If you're hard at work still, in his sovereignty, this is your reasonable service. If you're on the front line of medical support, you're doing this work in his service first and foremost, and then in the service of others. If you have a calling to medical work, look to God for your leadership and strength and know that we love you 
that we thank you for your care of others and we're praying for you day by day. We want to stand with you in any way we can. If you're working from home, work like God is your boss. Colossians 3 verses 23 to 24 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Maybe you are the human master and you lead others. If that's you, you're called to lead with godliness. Remember your work is a sacrifice of worship. How can you follow Jesus's example by putting others first through your work? How can you care for others and seek their peace and well-being in these difficult circumstances? Does your decision making and the principles you adhere to allow you to be seen as an ambassador for Christ? And if you've been furloughed, then I want to finish with encouragement, especially to you. Paid work is only one part of God's calling on our lives, and indeed not all work is paid. If God's big picture for you right now is time away from paid employment, I want to encourage you to look to God's purpose in that. Remember Romans 12, the way we use our bodies is our true and proper worship to God. Ask God what his calling is for your time right now and find excitement in the possibilities. You can worship with him with your body in so many ways beyond employment. How can you get to know God better in this time? How can you build relationships that signpost people to Jesus? How can you serve the church in a different way to normal? How can you meet the needs of others, of the most vulnerable, of one small slice of our society? I'm excited for you as you pray and find God's will for you in the, way, in the week ahead. Whatever your circumstances as we meet today, I hope you see God's hand in it and that you can find your reasonable service in it this week. Let me pray for us as we continue to worship God together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that what we do, we do in your service. We thank you for the privilege of working for the King of Kings and the Lords of the Lords. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we consider what your plans are for us this week, whatever our circumstances, that we would see Jesus, that we would understand your plans for us and that we would live excited about what we can do with you and for you this week. Heavenly Father, I pray for each member of the church family, for those who are excited about the week ahead, for those who are scared, for those who are worried or anxious. Lord, you know each of our needs and I pray that you would walk with us during the week ahead and that we would know your good hands upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What a privilege that we can worship God, that we can please him through the way that we work, through the attitude that we take to our current situation, whether that's furlough, unemployment, busier than ever, what a privilege that we can actually please God, the creator and sustainer of the universe. As we do that, we keep mercy in view, God's mercy. And we do that, as Jane said, by looking back at what Jesus has done. But we also do it by looking forward um, to the day when Jesus returns in glory. And that's what we're gonna be doing in a minute. Um, in a minute, we're gonna hear um, Revelation 22 preached to us that's the very last chapter of the Bible and it is when we see Jesus return in glory and call his followers to him so we're going to see this preached and we're going to hear it preached by Nate White and um, many of you will know Nate um, he's been around at the Globe Church since September he's an Oak Hill student so he's studying theology at Oak Hill it's a college in North London um, and he's been studying there and he's been sent on placement to the Globe Church to um, to serve us, to teach us, to learn from us and to share with us. So um, it's a great joy to hear him preach to us today. So Nate will be preaching Revelation 22 in a minute. Um, but before he does, we're going to sing. We're going to sing two songs together which fix our eyes on Jesus. The first one, Be Thou My Vision, um, is exactly that. Lord, be thou my vision. Let's keep Jesus's mercy in view. And the second one, O Church, arise and put your armour on, is a call to us as a church family to come together, to live for Jesus and to serve him so that we can please the God who created us. So we're going to sing these two songs, then Tom is going to lead us in prayer, and then we'll hear Nate preach Revelation 22 to us. Oh, church, arise and put your 
Pomeroy, he the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. For Christ will have the price for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet, as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet For the conqueror has risen And as the stone is rolled away And Christ emerges from the grave His victory march continues till the day Where every eye and heart shall see him So Spirit come, put strength in every stride Give grace for every hurdle That we may run with faith to win the prize Of a servant good and faithful As saints of old still on the way Retelling triumphs of His grace we hear their calls and hunger for the day When with Christ we stand in glory Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart Nor be all else to me save that thou art Thou my best thought by day or by night Waking or sleeping Thy presence, my light Be thou my wisdom Be thou my true word I ever with thee And thou with me, Lord Thou my great father Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. Be Thou 
my battle shield sword for the fight be thou my dignity be my delight thou my soul shelter and thou my high tower raise thou me heavenward O power of my power Riches I need not No man's empty praise Thou my inheritance Thou and always Thou and thou only the first in my heart High King of heaven, my treasure thou art High King of heaven, when victory's won May I reach heaven's joys, O oh, bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Heart of my own heart, whatever Still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Afternoon, everybody. I'm Tom, if we haven't met before. Um, let's pray. In Psalm 95, it says, In the Lord's hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you that you are Lord over the whole earth, and that it belongs to you. We thank you that we're not just on a rock, spinning through space on our own, but that every inch of our planet is yours and it's in the palm of your hand and that you watch over us with care and compassion. So Lord, we, we bring our world before you with all of the suffering and the death and the confusion and the upheaval at the moment and we ask for your intervention. <clears throat> in our own country, Lord, for the government and for Boris Johnson, um, for the people managing the NHS, we ask that you would give them wisdom in their decisions and the right uh, priorities in looking after the weakest and the most vulnerable. We ask that they would share your heart for justice. We ask the same for governments worldwide, that there would be cooperation and unity rather than competition and division. We pray that you would move in the hearts of the world's leaders and that you'd bring conviction of sin and that you are the Lord of the universe and that even if they have a lot of power, um, they still are in need of you, Lord. We pray they might humble themselves um, under your hand. <clears throat> and we ask as well that all of this upheaval might even create spiritual openness in the world, Lord. We know in the West in particular, we've become so close to you over the last few decades and centuries. And we long to see people in hundreds of and, and thousands um, to return to you. Lord, we long to see you honoured not just by a persecuted minority, but by the nations. You say in your word that your spirit is powerful to bring conviction of sin, of righteousness and judgment, to give life to the valley of dry bones. Um, Lord, so we ask in faith this afternoon that you would pour out your spirit on the world, 
on the nations, Lord, that people in their hundreds of thousands and millions would put their faith in you. And we thank you as well for our friends at Hope Church Vauxhall. Um, we ask that you would help them in lockdown, Lord, um, while they are unable to see each other in person. We ask that you would knit them together in love, um, closer, Lord, as the body of Christ, and that their love for each other would grow, even with the physical distance between them. We pray as well as they continue to mourn for Toby and Millie, Lord, that you would comfort them and draw near to them, and that they would continually know your peace and your compassion and the hope of eternal life. And as lockdown continues, Lord, and life can be so difficult, um, we want to ask for your help for ourselves, Lord, as we become more aware of our need for you. Um, work powerfully in our hearts, please, when we feel anxious about the future. We need to know your presence and your kindness and your provision. When we feel convicted of our selfishness and self-absorption, we thank you for your grace that forgives all of our sin and takes away all condemnation. And when we feel powerless to change, we need your spirit to move powerfully in our hearts to set us free from the chains of selfishness and to give us the love that you have for us, um, for others. So now, Lord, we offer you our hearts. Um, you are the one who can do more than we ask or imagine. Um, so we ask you to work in us and give us the character and love of Jesus. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi Globe Church, uh, it's Nate here and it's uh, a real disappointment not to be with you uh, today. But at the same time it is a joy and a privilege to be able to look at God's word with you. And before we do that, uh, let me pray for us and for that time. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can look at your word now together. We pray that you would uh, speak to us through it, that you would help us to see more of you in your character, and that you'd help us to see how amazing it will be when you return. Would you help us to long for the day that the Lord Jesus returns and that we will get to dwell with you for eternity? Lord, might we be found ready and eager when you return. Work through your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, around a month ago, I spent many days and many sleepless nights by a bed in a care home as my granddad progressively got more and more unwell. And it finally got to the point where he took his last, final gasping breaths. And I watched as he, as he passed from this life to death. And, and at that point, you, you do question your own mortality. And, and I think many people at the moment are questioning that and, and what is going on in our world. Why is there so much suffering? Why is there so much pain? Will, will there ever be a day that it will be over? Is there anything that we can hope to? Well, for the Christian, we have a wonderful hope of, of a future where death and sickness and sadness and pain will, will be over. The Bible, the Bible has this, this resolution this climax, this, this conclusion that, that the whole Bible is pointing to. And that is what we're looking at today. We're in the book of, of Revelation, which was written by a man called John. Now, now, John had actually been imprisoned on an island called Patmos because of what he believed. He believed in the Lord Jesus and it led him not to, to self-isolation, but government imposed isolation. He was being persecuted for what he believed. 
and he writes to seven particular churches in Asia who, who really are going through a similar experience to him. They are being persecuted for being Christians. They could be shunned socially for being Christians. They could be shunned financially. They, they could even lose their lives for being Christians. And John writes to them to give them hope. And now if, you, if you've ever read Revelation before, you are totally forgiven for finding it slightly strange and, and sometimes confusing. And the reason that is really is because of the genre. It is apocalyptic. There, there are visions that, that we're just not used to really in what we read today. But as we look at the final chapter of this book of Revelation, we, we read about how the Lord Jesus will return and how he will give his people eternal life. The, the aim of what John is writing here is, is to encourage us to be ready and to be eager for that return. And our first point that we see that through is verses 1 to 6. We will dwell with God forever. As I said, the Christians that, that John was writing to at the time were suffering, but he gives them this, this fantastic glimpse, this fantastic gaze to look forward to of eternity for their encouragement. And if you look at these opening verses, you'll see that John is, is with an angel in this vision. And the angel was taking him to a really significant place. In uh, Genesis 2, God, God has created the, the entirety of creation. And mankind is, is the pinnacle of his creation. And, and God places mankind in the Garden of Eden. And that is where God actually dwells with mankind. Mankind and God dwell together. And mankind, they, Adam and Eve have everything that they could ever want and everything that they could ever need. And in the garden there is a tree, the tree of life. And as God's good gift to humans, for eating of that tree, Adam and Eve could live forever. But there is also another tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God commands Adam and Eve not to eat from that tree. But they disobey. Adam and Eve want to be able to define what is good and evil, what is right and wrong themselves. They want to be God. And because of this rejection, this rebellion against God, God rightly punishes them. At that point in which they rebel against God, the curse of sin comes upon humanity. There is death, there is pain, there is suffering in this world because humans turned away from God. And God rightly casts Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. No longer are they to, to experience God's good gifts. No longer are they to have access to the tree of life. God even puts an angel in the entrance with a flaming sword so that no sinful human might ever enter again into the garden. And the rest of the Bible has, has this ongoing narrative that, that kind of builds upon itself. This question, <laughs> will sinful humanity ever get to dwell with a good and holy God again? And we do, we do see glimpses. We see glimpses in the tabernacle and, and in the temple and in some of the words of the prophets, but there's no final resolution until, until we come to another tree and the Lord Jesus dies upon the cross. Jesus came to earth and lived a perfect life and he died to take the punishment for our sin, our rebellion against God, so that we might be able to live in God's presence forever. He died upon a tree so that we might be able to eat from the tree of life. 
If you look down at, at verses 1 and verses 3, you'll, you'll see that on the throne with God, there, there is a lamb as well. That lamb is Jesus. He, he's the Passover lamb, the sacrificial lamb who died so that we might have life. Listen to these words from John Bunyan in, in the book Pilgrim's Progress, which describes how the Christian will, will one day get to experience this. You are now going to the paradise of God, in which you shall see the tree of life, and therefore eat of its never fading fruit. And when you arrive there, you shall be given white robes, and every day you shall walk and talk with the king for all the days of eternity. There you shall not see the former things, such as you saw when you inhabited the lower regions upon earth. That is sorrow, sickness, affliction and death. For these former things have passed away. Just even having a, a read of the news today, doesn't it just long you? Doesn't it make you long for the, the, the words at the end of verse 2? The leaves of the trees for the healing of the nations. And, and that is, the, that is a, a result, that will happen as a result of what Jesus did on the cross. As he died and then he rose again. We, we are brought into a relationship with God through that, to the, to the extent of which, verse 4, we, we will see his face. We will get to see God's face. Through, through the whole of the Bible, seeing God's face is seen as something that would lead instantly to a human dying. Humans are, are sinful, therefore they can't be in the presence of a, of a holy God. So to see his face would mean death. But Jesus, through his sacrifice, it means that we can dwell with God forever. We can serve him for what he's done for us. And God will provide all the light that we need as we reign with him forever, as you see at the bottom of verse 5. You see, there's something so, so powerful about seeing the face of someone you love, isn't there? We, I think we've realised that in the last couple of weeks. FaceTime and house party and Zoom and Skype, they, they, just, they just don't cut it. We, we long to see and actually physically be with the face of the person or the people we love. Well, one day we'll get to be with God and see him face to face. And John, John's not giving us here an exact representation of, of what heaven will look like. That's not his aim. But his aim is to encourage us. Just, just the idea, that vision of being able to dwell with God forever it should be something that we long for. It should leave us expectant. And, and the angel adds to that expectation, doesn't he, in verse 6. When we read the words, these things must soon take place. And that leads us on to our second point from this passage. Jesus will return soon. Now, focus on Thursday, we, we played an interesting game where we tried to guess when we'd next be able to physically meet up with each one another. And I don't know about you, but, uh, but I love dates. Not those kind of dates, um, but, but I love knowing when things are, knowing so that I can prepare for them, knowing that so that I can look forward to them. Some of my friends would say that even if I know the dates, I'm still late, but that is a side point. But I think if I was John in verse 6, I'd be tempted to ask the angel what they meant. When exactly are these things going to take place? And we don't have to wait for long, do we? Look at verse 7. Jesus himself enters the narrative and says, Look, I am coming soon. Remember I said that, that Revelation uses a lot of imagery? It also uses a lot, a lot of numbers. And those numbers represent different things. And, and the number seven in particular is really important. It, it appears 52 times in Revelation. 
There's seven churches, seven spirits, seven gold lampstands, seven stars, seven seals, seven signs, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven gold bowls, seven hills, seven kings, seven horns, seven eyes, seven trumpets, seven thunders. There's a whole lot of sevens. And there are also seven blessings. And one of those blessings comes here from Jesus. Jesus says that we are blessed if we keep the words of the prophecy, if we keep these words of revelation, if we take them to be true and apply them to our lives. And at this point, John is he's, he's so overcome by what is going on, he, he just falls down and starts worshipping the angel next to him. <laughs> but he's quickly corrected from that by the angel himself. The only person that is worth and worthy of all of our praise, all of our honour, is God. But we're still left with that question of, well, when, when is Jesus going to return? He says, come soon. What does that mean? And there are so many different references to other parts of the Bible in this passage. We could be here for hours. Don't worry, we won't be. But verse 10, it's particularly helpful to understand the context you see, back in the book of Daniel, Daniel has a similar vision to John. And he writes down this, this prophecy. It is in a scroll, but he is told to seal up that prophecy because the time is not yet near. Yet when we get to John here, we see that John is told not to seal up the words of this prophecy because the time is near for these things. And we might look back 2,000 years later after this was written and, and rightly question, well, was Jesus wrong? Well, worse, was he even lying? Well, the Bible never gives us an exact time Jesus will return. When he was on earth, Jesus repetitively said that actually it would, it would be a surprise to everyone. No one knows the exact time yet exact date. But God, God is, God is outside of time. So therefore, when, when Jesus says that he is returning soon, that really could mean any time. Peter's really helpful when he writes this in 2 Peter 3, 8 to 10. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Christians live, despite whatever you, you believe about the last days, they, they do believe knowing that Jesus could, he could come back at any point. Really, Christians are those who are living on the brink of eternity. And Jesus, in verse 12, repeats that he is coming soon. He, he's bringing this reward with him. That reward is eternity. And as he comes, he will judge people for what they've done. Now, at that point, we, we know that, that none of us actually deserve eternal life. We actually deserve death. But the seventh and final blessing is, is a wonderful picture to us. If you look at verse 14, you'll find this language, which might seem strange, to, to wash, wash your robes. What that's doing is that's taking us back to Revelation 7, where it speaks of how Christians are those who take their dirty robes their robes that have been made dirty by sin and they wash them in the blood of Jesus. It's picture language for describing trusting in Jesus' death on the cross and the blood he shed there as being the only thing that can wash us clean from sin. Because of Jesus' victory, we can be made pure. But there is a warning in this passage and that warning is that not everybody will rely 
on the Lord Jesus. And because of that, there will be those that will go to hell. They will experience eternal separation and punishment, separation from God. They won't see his face. They, they will get what they want, ultimately. If, if you don't love God, you wouldn't want to be in heaven to, to be with him for eternity, to worship him and serve him. Why would you? But hell is a, a terrible place of punishment for those who have rejected God's son, giving his life on the cross for them. All of this is, is Jesus' testimony. We see that in verse 16. He is from David's line. He's the one that all of the prophecies of the Old Testament point to. His testimony is true. He speaks to the churches and he says that he will return soon. And the final part of the revelation gives us a clear way that we are called to respond to this. And the final point is that we should long for Jesus' return. There is there's a clear instruction for us as we read Revelation. We should join the Holy Spirit and the global church in saying, come Lord Jesus. We, we live in a world, don't we, where we're constantly promised fulfilment. Every advert is promising us to feel complete in some way. We so can easily become seduced by believing that the world will, will bring us some kind of completion. But many of us have seen over the last couple of weeks that the things that we build our lives upon, the future plans that change, the foundations that so easily crumble in our lives, trusting in our own health, th these things, they can't save us, nor can they give us a true fulfilment. Sam Smith was recently attacked online for posting a photo crying outside of the 12 million pound mansion that Sam Smith lives in. And, and that, that, as much as he's being attacked for that, people, people are saying, well, how on earth you have everything? How can you cry at having to be self-isolated in a, a 12 million pound mansion? But that points to the fact that there is nothing in this world that really completes us. You can have all the money in the world. You can have the talents, the gifts. You can even be able to choose how to be able to define yourself freely in a culture that celebrates that. And yet none of that truly defines you and none of that truly completes you. But there is something that can meet our longing, a sure foundation. If you look at verse 17, you might be reminded of John T's sermon on John 4, the woman at the well with Jesus. Jesus offers eternal life. He offers eternal water, living water, to those that are thirsty. If you realise that you're not being completed by this world, that there, there's something else that you're longing for, Jesus offers you eternal life. And the amazing thing is it's, it's a free offer. <laughs> it's a free offer given, and yet it cost him everything. He paid the greatest cost by dying. His words are utterly important. That's why in verse 18 and 19 we have this stark warning not to add and not to take away from any of those words. The Christian's one who's been saved and therefore longs for Jesus' return. Knowing that we've been promised to dwell with God, that we'll one day be able to see his face means that we should be eager for Jesus to return. So to end, we'll try and apply this. How, how do we apply this to our lives? Well, I think it begs the question of, does Jesus' return fill us with real joy? Can we say along with the Spirit and along with the church, which is described as the bride here, that we want Jesus to return? And I think the answer to those questions highlights really what our heart's like. And it's really revealed what my heart's like this week. We so quickly get wrapped up in the present and our future plans in this world that actually 
our hearts are captured by something other than Jesus. And we don't long to see him because we're, we're making plans in this life. We're almost saying, just, just this one more thing, let me do that, and then I'll think about eternity. I think sometimes our, our approach to Christ's return is, is like kind of little children growing up. Let me explain. When a child, or when we were first growing up, when someone we loved, when our parents were returning, we'd be filled with joy. We'd be looking through the curtains, we'd be pacing the house, we'd be, every car engine that comes, we'd be wondering, are they there, are they there? And then they finally arrive, and we're filled with joy because of it. Yet as we get older, the, the world starts to take over. We start to, to love other things. And that person that we once loved and looked forward to returning, we just, we just deal with other things going on. They, could, they can even return from being away and walk past us and we can barely look up from our phones. Let us never be like that in relation to Jesus returning. It's important, I know, that in the same breath that we are saying that we do want Jesus to return, we are appreciating that there are some that we know and love who aren't saved. And I'm also not saying that your present circumstances and the present isn't important. But, but actually our prayer should be that those we love do come to know Jesus at the same time as praying Jesus come back. Save them and come back. And I think particularly as we, we think about meeting together again, there, there's something that, that we can capture about this. You see, we are so looking forward to meeting together as a church. I would love to have a congregation in front of me now instead of speaking to the camera. But that should point us to a greater day where we'll gather as the entire church. We had a really encouraging reminder about that from a poem that Sally wrote for Globe Daily. Let me read some of it. Yet he reminded me that it is not only for this day that we wait, but a day which even in our busyness was near, when we will gather as one church with every saint, richer, fuller, a place without fear, excessive blessing, a promise fulfilled, life forevermore. I look at my life and I so easily become busy and consumed with the things of this world that I can take my eyes off eternity. And as much as we look forward to being together again, it should really point us to the day that we'll be gathered as the entire church. We'll see the tinkers there, hopefully with people that they've even led to Christ who we've never met and that are living across the world from us. Some of you will be reunited with Toby and Millie. We'll see Christians that have lived through out the whole history of this world and will be gathered together all to praise the Lord Jesus. <laughs> what a day. That is our hope. And if you don't have that hope right now, if you're not trusting in the Lord Jesus, that is an offer that is extended to you. You can have your, your sin paid for on the cross. He gives you that offer. You can wash your robes, as it says in verse 14, in his blood and be guaranteed eternal life with him. You could turn to him even now. And for those of us that are trusting in Christ, well, we should long for his return. If, if we truly accepted the words of revelation, we would live a life that's not, not focused on the present, but one that is ready and so, so eager for Jesus' return. We would say, come Lord Jesus. Let me pray for us that we might be able to do that. Heavenly Father, thank you that we have your word. We know that the testimony of Jesus is true. He is coming soon. And we don't know when that is, Lord, but we pray that he would find us 
ready and eager for him to return. Lord, for those of us that have family and friends and those that don't yet know you, would you encourage us to keep praying for them that they would know this truth? And Lord, I pray if there is anyone now who's listening to this that doesn't know you, that they would even now turn to you and rely on your son's death on the cross. Lord, make us more eager for your return. Make us a people that say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. We have the opportunity now um, to sing in response to this. Joe is going to lead us in a song that gets us thinking about the fact that Jesus is the conquering king and that one day he will return and we can glorify and praise him because of that truth.
thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and I hope this has been an encouragement. I hope as we look forward to the day when Jesus returns in glory, we can be excited and eager for his return. And as we look back at his mercy, we can live lives of sacrifice, pleasing to the God who created us. It's exciting, isn't it? Let me pray for us as we close. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have a certain hope that Jesus will one day return. And Lord, we pray that this week, as we go about our lives, as we carry on living through this strange and uncertain time, Lord, the certainty of that hope, the certainty of Jesus' return would grip our hearts and it would make us long to live for him. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Well, thanks so much for coming today and do please keep in touch. If you've got any questions or you need to contact anyone from the church family, do please reach out. Um, the email address info at globe.church is available to anyone. Um, or if you can want to contact me or Jonty or Linda or Anais or anyone else, we'll be very, very, very happy to speak to you. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks very much. And as we say,